All right. Let me make sure I got everything. We are ready. OK. All right. Well, he hello, everyone. Um, I'm back with a second midterm review, and I have a new cursor. This is my little crocodile. Um, the sky's here, so you can actually see my cursor this time, because uh, I know last time that I recorded, uh, a lot of people came up to me afterwards and were talking about how they couldn't really see the cursor. Um, so now you have this guy, so every time I write, he's kind of there. Hopefully it's not too, too laggy. Um, and uh, I'm also just doing a recording of this uh, midterm review instead of in person because I feel like last time when I did the when I did the uh, the midterm one review, um, I feel like I was like rushed a little bit and there was like tons and tons of content to go over in a short amount of time. Luckily, this this midterm uh, really only has two top two primary topics to go over, so. I'm going to try to do my best to go over these in, in detail and uh, work out some examples for you guys. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so first, I'll just like to talk about. Uh, I just kind of want to get you familiar like with what an op amp actually is, what an op amp actually does, what it means to be talking about. Um, like an ideal op amp versus a realistic op amp. <clears throat> so let's talk about a realistic op amp model first. So this is just a picture. Um, I think uh, Professor Kogan has shown you this picture, um, what a realistic op amp, will, op amp model looks like. Um, basically, you have a voltage, a positive voltage and a negative voltage at the terminals. Um, these can be swapped out interchangeably. And in the inside of this op amp, you have essentially a uh, a little uh, source right here, and you notice that it's in a diamond shape. What that means is that it is a dependent source. So uh, a regular source is like this, a DC source, but a dependent source is like this. <clears throat> and they're basically this. They're they're essentially the same, but the only difference between these guys is the dependent source like the name implies, uh, depends on something. So it depends on another part of the circuit, essentially. And that just means it depends on either like a, another voltage somewhere or another current somewhere. But in this case, it's a voltage controlled voltage source. So this little dependent source right here depends on your input voltages. And depending on these input voltages, uh, that's the voltage output that you'll receive in a nutshell that's that's kind of what it's going on um <clears throat> so uh so let's talk about this so the input uh resistance for a, a realistic op amp model well and an ideal op amp model as well but basically the input resistance is going to be very large a very large resistance um but in a realistic op amp model it's not equal to an infinite value it actually has a it actually has a value, um, and the uh, output resistance is very small, but it's not equal to zero, which is this one right here, this output resistance. And then we have the gain, which is also very large. AV is the gain, um, and it's a very large value, but it's not equal to infinity. And this is all for a realistic op amp. <clears throat> And uh, I just have a note here. So the gain is the, the ratio or multiplier between the signal at the inputs versus the signal at the output. I'm sure you guys know most of this by now. Um, but let's just talk a, few, a quick uh, about the, let's talk real quick about the ideal op amp properties. So um, the ideal op amp properties are basically, um, basically saying that in an ideal world, this is what the op amp wants to do. But because of reality uh, in the realistic op amp model, that that doesn't happen. Like you can't go to infinity or zero in an ideal or in a realistic op amp like here. So in an ideal op amp, the voltage gain is equal to the V out over V in, which is equal to infinity. And it's equal to infinity because this is an ideal op amp. <clears throat> and then the bandwidth is equal to infinity. We'll talk more about this later. The input impedance is equal to infinity. 
output impedance is equal to zero. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to cover these a little bit more here in a little bit, but I just I'm just going to just brush through these real quick. Um, and then one of the most important rules uh, for ideal op amps and it's, it's good to know that we're talking about ideal op amps here, but the, one of the most important rules is the input that comes into these terminals. Right here. Um, is going to be zero. Uh, so basically the input, uh, sorry, the current coming in this terminal and the current coming in this terminal is going to be equal to zero. And then if negative feedback exists, then the voltage here will equal the voltage here. Um, I'm just using this diagram as to, for, for uh, you know, for uh, instructive purposes. This is this, I'm not talking about a realistic op amp. I'm talking about an ideal op amp. I'm just using this diagram to show you. So the, the positive voltage here uh, will equal the negative voltage here if a negative feedback exists. And I'll go into what that means uh, here in a second. So, oh yeah. So um, V out over VN, um, this was kind of always confusing to me when I was learning this in this class because V out over VN is like defined a million times. Um, it could be defined as voltage gain, AKA gain, um, AKA voltage transfer function, AKA attenuation ratio. So all of these words basically mean <laughs> V out over VN. <clears throat> and I know that's kind of confusing, but uh, it just it is what it is, I guess. But uh, let me let me just talk about this diagram real quick before we dive into op amps uh, or before we dive into uh, specifics. So this is a voltage amplifier, and basically that is an op amp, but I just drew it differently. I just drew it. Uh, I drew it modeling this diagram or this uh, schematic right here, but basically I just separated out the inside of this op amp here, like right here. So I'm just talking about the inside of this um, right here. <clears throat> and I wanted to talk about this briefly because, oops, I wanted to talk about this briefly because uh, this is not always very clear when you're looking at all these infinities and these zeros, you're like, what are you talking about? Why do you, why do you have all these infinite signs and, and zeros? Like, what does this mean? <laughs> so just to just to talk about this real quick. So this is a voltage amplifier, like I said, and this is a dependent source. And this dependent source is called a voltage controlled voltage source. There's many other types of dependent sources. This is just the one we're talking about right now. Um, <clears throat> so this voltage controlled voltage source depends on um, it depends on A uh, times Vn. So A times Vn is just the gain, like right here, times Vn, which is this. So, so that's basically saying Av times V plus minus V minus. Uh, and that's just saying uh, A, the gain is uh, multiplied by the difference between these two terminals. So whatever the difference between these two terminals is, multiply AV times that, and that's what that's what's driving this source, right? So ideally, in this voltage amplifier, what we want to do is we want to amplify. This is our input side. This is our output side. We want to have a voltage here, and we want to amplify this voltage by some amount, right? So this is what we want. This is our result. We want to amplify that voltage source. And to do that, we have to go through this whole interior of this, uh, this op amp, right? So there's a problem with us wanting to amplify this voltage uh, on its output right here. Because if you notice, there's a voltage divider right here between these two um, I'm actually calling these impedances, but uh, I'm just that's why I don't have them as resistors. I have them as little block diagrams because technically um, to be technically correct, this is actually impedances, but uh, that's just kind of nitpicking right now. But um, basically. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so we want to we want to amplify this voltage source right here on the output. 
but there's a voltage divider right here that's blocking us from doing that. So whenever I say that we want RI to be very large, um, that's this right here. We want this input impedance to be very large. We want input impedance or input impedance to be equal to infinity for a ideal op amp. So what happens if we turn this into infinity is this is just a open circuit, right? That's infinity. Because infinite resistance means that you just have an open circuit essentially. And then, so that takes care of that voltage divider right there, right? We don't have to worry about that anymore. But now on this side, we still have a problem. We have this other impedance, uh, chain of impedances, and this is also another voltage divider here. So in order to get rid of this voltage divider situation, we need our output impedance right here to be zero for an ideal op amp. We need our output impedance to be zero which is right here is saying for a realistic op amp, our O is very small, but it's not equal to zero. This one's saying output impedance equal to zero. So if we turn this uh, impedance to zero, it turns into a short, right? It turns into a short. And so now we have no voltage, voltage division between these two elements anymore. And so now we, in an ideal op amp, with this being open and this being shorted, we have a direct path from this voltage source to the here to amplify the voltage. And so uh, I hope I explained that uh, well enough, but um, that I kind of wanted to do this demonstration so you can kind of understand a little bit more what's going on uh, inside of an op amp. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the different types of op amps. Um, <clears throat> we have an inverting amplifier. This is like your bread and butter. You know, this is like one of the most basic uh, op amps. <clears throat> and an inverting amplifier reverses the polarity of the input signal while amplifying it. So um, this is actually what the input waveform of an inverting amplifier looks like. And this is what the output waveform would look like. Notice that it inverses the polarity of the waveform, meaning that this is a positive first and then this is negative. So it just it just basically flips the, the polarity of the waveform, but it's also an amplifier, an inverting amplifier. So it actually amplifies this output as well. So this is like a very small amplitude this is amplifying it, right? So that's that, that's exactly what it's doing. That's what this circuit does. Um, and so, um, basically, this is this is going to be true for all ideal op amps. If uh, gain is equal to infinity with negative feedback, uh, then the input voltages here and here are going to be equal to each other. So, negative feedback basically is just saying you have some portion of this output coming back through this feedback resistor RF back into the input, right? And it's negative feedback because it's going from the output right back into this negative terminal. If you had a wire coming this way and a resistor going this way, and this was RF, that would be considered positive feedback. But I don't think you have to really worry about that in any of your problems or in this class. So as long as you see negative feedback, you can assume that you can assume that uh, this current. So let's just say this is I, I, I in for I negative terminal. And let's say this is a IP for I positive terminal. So you could say I in. Um, equals IP equals zero. And then that's one condition. And then the other one is this one, VX, this, the voltage between these two terminals are gonna be equal to each other. And uh, 
here's your kind of uh, basic equations um, for an inverting amplifier. Um, so V out uh, is equal to negative RF over RN um, times uh, input voltage, and then the gain is equal to this essentially times VI. <clears throat> so we have a non-inverting amplifier, which is a, a an op amp circuit that is uh, basically provides a positive voltage gain, uh, but with amplification, uh, amplification, it doesn't invert the waveform. So if you notice, this is what the input waveform looks like. All it does is it just amplifies it, makes it makes it a larger amplitude. Um, and so again, we have negative feedback right here. Um, and I should mention real quick, uh, open loop gain means you don't have any feedback, um, which means that the gain goes to infinity as well. Um, but a what, what's called a, when you have a negative feedback like this, it's called a closed loop gain. So just, just for terminology's sake, you should, you should know that. Um, okay. And so, yeah, we, we just amplify the, the output waveform. Um, and I'm sure you've done problems like this uh, with these equations and whatnot. Um, yeah, so these th there's not really much of a difference here besides the equations between these two. Uh, the only difference is you have this source coming into this positive terminal, and then you have the source right here going into this negative terminal. So let's go down to the summing amplifier. Um, the summing amplifier is an, is an amplifier uh, is an op amp circuit that uh, combines several inputs and produces an output that is the weighted sum of the inputs. So basically, it's just an inverting amplifier, but you have multiple sources. That's that's really all it is. Just to just simplify it down, you know, this is an inverting amplifier, but just multiple sources attached to the input. So it's just a little bit of a different um, formula, you know. Not a big deal. Um, has the exact same waveform. So here's the input waveform, and the output waveform um, is inverted because you're again you're going into the negative terminal. So the output waveform is inverted, and it's also amplified by an even larger amount because you have multiple sources. <clears throat> and then we have the difference amplifier. Um, a difference amplifier is a device that amplifies the difference between the two inputs, um, but rejects any signal common to the two inputs. Uh, and I think she just mentioned this in her slides and to you guys that for, for a difference amplifier for this class, you, you really only have to worry about the situation um, where all the resistors are equal to each other, um, which gives you this very nice simplified formula. <coughs> um, and what I'm going to show you, I'm going to work out some problems, but what I'm going to show you is uh, you don't always have to just rely on these 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 equations like, you know, you get these V out equations and you're just like trying to just brute force and make you make your way uh, through the problem using these these equations that you're given, which they are handy, definitely. Um, but you can do you can solve them other ways as well. Um, OK, so I have a I have a uh, example problem here, and this is just basically uh, I just pulled one from, you know, your uh, your homework. But. Um, so give me one second. <clears throat> one second. Okay, I had to grab a blanket. It's freezing in here. All right, so uh, <clears throat> let's just go through this problem real quick. And it says for the circuit below, assume that VS is uh, five volts peak to peak. Okay, so we have five volts. R1 is 1400. R2 is 4100. R3 is 8,800 ohms. <laughs> and find the values of the four uh, currents, I1, I2, I3, and 
I out. So I know it's not asking for V out here, but um, we could actually solve for V out just by finding these currents as well without using uh, the the. Uh, so notice that this is a non-inverting uh, amplifier because it's going from the source directly into the positive terminal. So you do have these equations up here, but you can actually solve it a different way. And I just wanted to show you all that. <clears throat> so even though these are op amps and they kind of look scary, uh, you can actually use just your regular tools like you always do, uh, KCL, KVL, uh, Ohm's Law. I mean, they work here, right? They're just, it's a DC source, you know, it's not a big deal. So you can actually use all these, all these uh, tools that you already know. So that's what I'm going to do here. Um, so let's say KCL at at node. OK, so let's say this is node A. And we'll say KCL at node A. So KCL at node A says, um, well, we have an I1 here going in, right? So I1, and then we have an I2 going in. Uh, and then we have another current right here going out. Let me see this. OK, so we know that this is an ideal op amp. And since this is an ideal op amp, we know that the current, this this I n right here uh, is uh, 0 because it's an ideal op amp. And we have it right here. And we, know, we also know that that this is true that this i n is a uh, zero we know that this is true because we have a feedback resistor right here so we have an output and a feedback resistor going into this negative terminal so we know that this is zero and so that leaves us with i1 equals negative i2 right okay so now let's do the same thing for our other node which is KCL at node B. And we'll just make a, another node here, B. So what do we have here? We have, well, we have I out uh, going in, and then we have two currents going out of this node, which is I2 and then I3. So I out equals I2 plus I3. OK, so now we have two equations right here. To use to solve uh, for the voltages that we want, but. How do we solve for those voltages? So. Well, actually, how do we solve for these currents as well? Because that's really what the that's really what the problem is asking for is all these all these currents. But I wanted to show you all also how to find V out. <clears throat> but uh, OK, so. Let's look at Ohm's law now, so. We have I1. What is I1 equal to? Here's I1. I1 is equal to. Uh, well, this is ground. Right, so this is zero volts on this side. And then this side right here. Well, we don't know this voltage right here. Right, but. If we if we if we notice if we go back to our rules for ideal op amps, this rule right here, we could say that as long as there is negative feedback, which there is, right here, as long as there's negative feedback, we can say that these two voltages, the voltage here, is equivalent to the voltage here. So let me just I'm gonna just draw a highlighter just to really just to really hammer this home. So. This whole voltage comes up here, goes through here. And that whole node, this is all one node. This whole node 
is five volts. So we can say, uh, oops, we can say this note, this this node right here, or sorry, not this node, but this voltage right here is going to be V in, I'm going to say. And then this voltage right here is going to be VP, right? But we just proved that VN is equal to VP because we have a negative feedback. So that means that this voltage coming out of this source is equivalent on both terminals. So back to what we're looking for. We're looking for I1. I1 is zero volts on this side because we're attached to ground. And then we have we have VP is equal to VN on this side. So VN is five volts, right? So I'm just gonna oops. I'm just gonna say zero minus five volts. I should say VN. I'll, I'll change it later. Over R1. Okay. I'll change the values later. And now we want to find I2. So <clears throat> let's look at I2. What happens at I2? Well, here's I2. We want to find the Ohm's law equivalent of this current at I2. So that means that we have a V out right here on this side. And then we have a five volts or a VN on this side. So we could say V out minus V in oops, over R2, right? And then finally, we want to find I3, which is right here. So I3. Well, I3 is right here. We have a V out going across this resistor, and this is a zero volt because it's attached to ground. So you don't have to do any subtraction. You can just say V out over R3. And now we can actually, we have a relationship between Ohm's law and these currents and these KCL equations. So now let's bring this equation down here. So I1 equals negative I2. And we know I1 is this. So we could say negative V in over R1 equals negative right here, I2, which is V out minus V in uh, over R2. OK, so now we want to. Uh, I, I, I know we want to find the currents, but um, I did want to show you all how to solve for V out manually without having to rely on those equations. So that's what I'm going to do uh, first. I want to do that first. Um, so let's do that real quick. So we want to solve for V out. So how do we get V out by itself? Well, we need to multiply this uh, R2 over. And it's a negative R2, so these negatives are going to cancel. So if we do that, we're going to have. Oh, I should write it up this way. So let's just say R2 times Vn over R1. Um, and then if we sub if we add over this Vn plus Vn equals V out. Okay. So now we can actually just plug in all of our values that we have to find V out. And let's see, this is a non-inverting amp, so let's see how close we got to the actual equation. Non-inverting right here. So VI, so input voltage plus, and then one plus RF over RS. So if we actually factored out a VN here, it'd be VN um, multiplied. And then we could bring this R2 in. So it'd be R2 over R1 plus 1. And I think that's actually it, isn't it? Let's see. Yeah, and that's actually the equation we get. 
So I was just doing a long-winded way of proving that formula, essentially. Um, but yeah, so let's just plug in these values now. And I need to grab my calculator, actually. OK, so what is a VN? VN is 5. So we're going to have 5. And then R2 is 4100. R1 is 1400 plus 1. One second. Grab my calculator. Okay, and that comes out to 19.64. So that's actually the output voltage. <clears throat> it's actually the output voltage of our non-inverting amplifier. And if you notice, we started with 5 volts. That's a pretty massive output voltage. So that's essentially what this amplifier is doing, right? You're amplifying the output voltage. OK, so um, now uh, now that we have V out, it's actually going to be a lot easier to find these other currents. Uh, you could have done this a different way if you wanted to, but I just decided to do it this way just to show you the proof and also just to show you uh, that you can actually get this manually without just relying on the formula only, you know. So now we have V out, right? So we can actually just plug it in here. So let's say. I3 is equal to V out over R3. So 19.64 over R3, which is 8,800. Let me type that up. Okay, so that's going to be equal to, let's see, one, two, three. So that's 2.23 milliamps. And finally, we have this one, I2. So that's V out minus Vn over R2. So V out is uh, 19.64 minus Vn, which is 5. And then R2 is right there, 4,100. Okay. Okay, and that is equal to uh did I do that right? Yeah. Okay, sorry, making sure I did that right. So that's gonna be equal to three point five seven lamps. OK, so we didn't do I1. That's where I was getting lost. I was like, OK, where am I missing? OK, I1 real quick. So we have that's just an easy one. We didn't have to solve for V out for that. So that's negative. Vn is 5 over R1. Uh, R1 is 1400. So negative 5. So I1 is equal to negative 3.5. 7 milliamps. OK. Um, oh, we need finally I out. So I out uh, is this one. So I2 plus I3. So I2 is right here. Um, I2, 3.57 plus I3, 2.23. These are in milliamps. OK, so now we have all of our currents. One, I two, uh, I three, 
and then I out. And we solve for V out along the way. Um, so hopefully that was a pretty helpful uh, problem there. And let's just move on to the next one. I just grabbed one of these from uh, one of my other classes just to do a quick one. Let me shrink this down so don't run out of room here. Um, OK, so this is our op amp and we need to uh, find IL, which is this this current in this little branch right here. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we need to look at this op amp first. Anytime I get an op amp problem, first thing you want to do is like kind of just kind of just visualize what's happening, right? Uh, so we have two sources here. Um, so we have two sources, and so that means that it's going to be a uh, difference amplifier. And so, but previously on this problem, we didn't have any resistances or any resistors in here to kind of block from the source. The source is going directly through all this, right? But here, this source is immediately hitting a resistor. This source is immediately hitting a resistor. So, and th there's a resistor here. There's no way to really tell what this voltage is right here. Um, and generally, uh, in an op amp problem, nine times out of 10, you're going to need to find this, this voltage here. Like that's, that's your number one goal is to find this voltage here, because if you find the voltage at this point, you're going to know the voltage here, you know? Um, and if you find the voltage here, you're going to know the voltage there, same thing. So, uh, how do we do that? So we have a source right here and we have two resistors, right? So we can actually just do voltage division here and that'll give us this voltage right here. And I showed you all voltage division last time and I think you already know how to do it anyways. So let's go ahead and just write out a quick little voltage division. Um, and we'll say this is VP and this is VN like we've been saying. So VP is equal to well, we want the voltage right here, so we need to take the voltage drop across this one for our formula. So let's do R2 over R1 plus R2 um, times the voltage source, which is this source in this case, because we're doing the voltage division across this branch, not this source, right? So we'll say this is gonna be VP, no, oh, actually, let me do this, that's not equal to. VP uh, is equal to, let's just plug in our values that we have here. So R2 is right here, this is 5K. And then we have R1, which is right here. So that's R1 plus R2. And then our voltage source is right here, that's six volts, right? So let me write that up, so that's 15, oh. That's actually just two. Okay, and so now we just found out what VP is. So now that we know what VP is, and this is an ideal, ideal op amp because again we have a we have a negative feedback right here. So because we have this negative feedback, that's how we know it's an ideal op amp. So since we just solved for VP, we now know that the voltage is also two volts right here along the VN. So let me just draw that out just so you guys can see it. This whole node right here is interconnected. And that is all two volts. VP is equal to VN. These, this whole node is two volts. So I always recommend just, if you see like a source with two voltages like this, and you, especially if you're going straight back to ground or uh, back to the voltage source, anything like that, always look for voltage division opportunities because it's such an easy formula to do and it just it's it's such a nice way to solve things um oh but anyways we still need to find the current um right here right we still don't know what this is so how do we find the current here looking at this problem um 
Well, again, we can just use the tools that we have, the tools that we know, um, and use KCL at this node right here. Let's call it A. So KCL at A. So what do we have at case? What do we have here? We have um, we have IF coming in. We have an IO coming in. We have an IL leaving, right? Oops. Let's see. So let's write that out. So we have IF plus IO equals IL. All right. So what is the current for? Um, Uh, let's see. Can we do it yet? I don't think we can do it there. Let's change this node actually to this one for now. Because I don't know what these 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 are going to be yet. So actually, we're going to have to change. I was just thinking about this. We're going to actually have to change it here first. So let's just redraw that. Um, so let's do, this is A now. So let's say, what do we have here for KCL A? We have IS coming in, um, and then we have an IN and an IF going out. And I know I keep drawing this IN, which is not really necessary because we know this is an ideal op amp, but I'm just going through every single step like rigorously, you know, to make sure you guys understand this. Um, we know this is an ideal op amp. We know that current coming in right here and current coming in right here is always going to be zero. So this is zero. So IS is equal to IF. Okay. So let's say. What is IS? Where's IS? IS is right here, right? So we have a voltage source right here, and then we have a voltage right here. So let's try to draw what IS is. IS is going to be, well, it's going to be five, but notice that this source is actually turned upside down. So this is actually negative five volts. So this is negative five. And then subtracted, because you're going across this now. And this is VP, but it's also equal to VN. We know that this is whole node is two volts. So two over, and then this resistor, 3K, equal to, and I'm just saying this is IS equal to IF, right? I'm just drawing out what IS is. Now I'm drawing out what IF is. IF is, where's that? Right here. So we have this voltage that we know subtracted from this voltage that we don't know and over this resistor. So let's say two minus V out over 6K. Okay, so now we really just need to solve for this V out and then we'll be able to solve for IL because we have the resistance, but we can't solve for IL with only resistance. We need a voltage, right? Ohm's law. So that's where this is at right here. So let me just let me just simplify this a little bit. So this is negative seven over three thousand equal to two over six thousand minus one over six thousand. And then this will be VO. Right? And if we just I'm just I'm just drawing out every single step. I know you don't have to necessarily do it this slow, but uh, you know. So let's just add this over, or let's just do this quick math real quick. So just type it in the calculator at this point. Because we would subtract this over, divide this over, or sorry, multiply this over. So let's do that on the calculator right now.
OK, I'm getting. 16 volts. As my VO. OK, so now. IL. Is equal to we have that voltage now. Ohm's law VO over that resistance 8K. So this is just 16 over 8K. It's going to be 2 milliamps. Right? OK, so again, we didn't necessarily have to look for any go up here and like look for these specific formulas and, and work this out. This was a this was a, actually a difference amplifier, you know, uh, a little bit tricky um, and I know you don't necessarily have to worry about it, but I just kind of wanted to show you working one out all the way, uh, finding a specific value somewhere like current somewhere specific or voltage somewhere specific. Um, so that's pretty much how you could do it. Basically what I'm getting at is you just need to utilize the tools that you know, utilize the tools that you have, KCL, KVL, Ohm's law, you know, um, voltage division, current division, all of these things can be applied even to op amps. Um, okay, so those are two quick little uh, problems for op amps. And by the way, I'm gonna upload this like I did last time on the IEEE uh, tutoring discord. So don't, you know, don't, don't have to worry about that. I will upload this so you guys can see it. So let's move on to filters real quick. Um, so a filter is basically a circuit that is capable of passing or amplifying certain frequencies while attenuating other frequencies. And attenuating comes up a lot when you're talking about filters, but attenuating just means, you know, uh, trying to block a certain frequency. And uh, I hope that this siren is not picking up in the background, but. Um, so there's many practical applications, radio communication, uh, audio electronics, DC power supplies, ADCs. Uh, here's the four primary filters. You don't have to worry about this one because uh, you're not learning that right now. But basically you have this complex signal coming in and it gets broken up into multiple parts and these filters can pick and choose what they you know, want to pass or block essentially. That's, that's essentially the, the, the filter's goal. Uh, so there's two types of filters. There's passive and active. Uh, a passive filter only includes components, um, passive components like resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Operates best at low frequencies, lower frequencies, 100 hertz to 300 megahertz. Um, and then active filters and active uh, includes active components such as op amps, diodes, and tra transistors. Operates best at low frequent lower frequencies than 100, um, and can provide voltage gain. So. Let's look at these real quick. This is a low pass filter, and this is basically all the information you should know for, again, you don't have to worry about this, all the information you should know for, for filters for this class. Um, so let's just go through the definitions real quick, and then I'll talk about them. So attenuation ratio, uh, which is what I was saying earlier, is V out over Vn, and that's in decibels right here. So this Y axis, basically is attenuation ratio V out over VN. <clears throat> and then we have the cutoff frequency FC right here on these. Um, it's the frequency at which the output power is re reduced by one half. Um, basically V out is equal to VN um, uh, one over square root of two. And that's also called the half power frequency. Basically because uh, right when that, when that frequency gets hit, it's at half power output. And then the pass band, which is this little area in here, is the band of frequencies that do not experience significant attenuation, meaning that they're passed. They're in the pass band. <clears throat> and then the bandwidth uh, is the width of the pass band. So from here to here, that's that's the width of the of the pass band. And then the stop band frequency, FS, is the band of frequencies where the filter does not allow signals to pass. So that's basically where you're going to be attenuating. That's where your filter is going to start right here. Your filter is going to start trying to block frequencies past the pass band. 
uh, after I should say after the pass band. And so low pass uh, passes low frequencies and blocks high frequencies. High pass passes high frequencies and uh, blocks low frequencies. And a pass band is a low pass and a high pass combined, forming this little region right here. And this little region blocks only a, I mean, not blocks, uh, passes only a certain little tiny uh, width of frequencies. Um, so this filter is used the most, I would say, uh, to find to find uh, specific radio stations. You know, this is what this little passband frequency does. Um, there's a bunch of different scenarios for it, but I just know it by definition, I guess. Uh, so we have a low pass filter, um, and these are all the definitions of the low pass filter. Uh, this is directly from y'all's slides. So this is basically an op amp, uh, and it's an inverting op amp because you got the source going directly into the inverting terminal. And really all that changed is you slapped on a capacitor up here and then turned this into an impedance instead of a resistance up here. So that's what, when I was talking about up here at the top, when I was talking about why I have these boxes and not resistors, that's the reason why is because these are actually impedances sometimes and not only just resistances sometimes. So, uh, yeah, so you slap a capacitor in there and now it's an impedance, not just a resistance. And so low pass filter, here's all your equations. Um, high pass filter, here's what it looks like. And you basically put a capacitor here and it's a it's a inverting op amp with the capacitor in the, in there now and uh, yeah that's that's pretty much it you turn this into an impedance instead of a resistance uh, bandpass filter now you have now you have a, a p impedance up here and an impedance right here instead of just resistances because you're combining the low pass with the high pass and here's all of your equations for the uh, pass band stuff. And here's an equation. Here's a conversion right here between these two. So, if you get your gain in decibels and you want to uh, put it in volts per volt, you would use this formula. And if you have your gain in volts per volt, you would use this equation to. Uh, well, you could do it either way. Um, yeah, if you had it in, if you had it in, uh, if you, sorry, I should say it this way. If you want it in dBs, you would use this equation on an AV that's in volts per volt. If you wanted your gain in volts per volt, you would use this equation on an, on an A that's in decibels, on a gain that's in decibels already. So here's a couple of other decibel equations to find the passband gain in decibels. Uh, oh yeah, this is just a summary of that, but you can do, but you can put the absolute value of the gain in the pass band in there as well, instead of just V out over VN, which is your typical A value. Uh, but this is just for specifically the pass band. Um, at the cutoff uh, frequency, if you wanted to find the gain for that, at the cutoff frequency, it's just the gain uh, in the pass band divided by the square root of two, and that turns out to be in volts per volt as a result. So. You need to make sure you're aware of this. It, it, the output of this will be in volts per volt. Um, and then in dB, uh, you could actually just do this. The, the gain at the cutoff frequency would be GPB minus 3 dB uh, as, a, as a shortcut, but I usually just do this. And then um, V out at the uh, cutoff frequency is just V out uh, at the pass band divided by square root of 2, and that's in volts. So uh, I got a couple of quick examples for you guys, and then we'll call it. So let's just knock out a couple of uh, quick examples real quick. Um, so let's see. This one is a high pass filter because we have the capacitor right here, uh, and we have the source right here, and we go in right into the negative terminal. So if we go back here. Oh, wait, no. This one <laughs> went too far. Um, so this one, yeah, is a, a high pass filter and these are our values uh, that were given to us in this problem and we need to find V out. It gave us the radians as well. So we need to find V out. 
So how do we find the output voltage here of a high pass uh, high pass filter? Well, now that we're in the realm of capacitance, we have impedance values, right? So what are our impedance values? ZR is equal to R. We all you already know all this. ZC is equal to one over J omega C. And then ZL is equal to J omega L. So these are our three impedances that we use anytime you throw a complex, uh, like a, a, a capacitor and inductor into the mix. So um, let's see, what do we want to solve for first here? Let's solve for what's the bet. What the best thing, best thing to do is I think is just to solve for your ZI value. So let's try to do that. So ZI is equal to what? Well, we have a resistor and we have a capacitor and we know these are our impedance equations. So ZI is equal to, and, and they're also in series. That's another thing to note, they're in series. So ZI is equal to RI plus one over J omega CI. And that's just, I is just, you know, I'm just lining them up with this Z, ZI essentially. Um, so honestly, we, I think we have all of these uh, values. So let's just, let's just plug this in and see what we get. So this is going to be equal to a thousand because we're right here, a thousand ohms plus one over J omega is a thousand times uh, the capacitance. Okay, so let me type this real quick. Okay, so this is going to be, okay, so this is actually going to be equal to uh, 1000 because nothing changed here. But remember that since you have a J on the bottom, you can actually bring up a J to the top and it'll be negative. So one over J is equal to negative J, right? So if we do that, we're gonna have negative J and then we calculate this entire value is gonna be 250. So now that we have this, this is in its uh, rectangular form, right? <clears throat> well, we can't really do much with it in its rectangular form. So we need to convert this. To its, uh, to its phasor form in order to find V out. So let's convert this rectangular form to its phasor form. So ZI is equal to square root 1000 squared plus 250 squared and then times inverse tangent. Uh, then we're gonna have negative 250 over 1000. And let me calculate that real quick. Okay, that's gonna be eight. Okay, so that is our impedance value, but and it's a phasor notation, right? So, uh, all right, so now let's use, let's go back to our high pass filter right here. So now let's find this, This we need to use this equation, gain outside the pass band. So G is equal, equal to negative RF, oh no, no, sorry, pass band approximation, this one. No, no, this one. No, I was right the first time. Negative RF over ZI, yeah. OK, so RF is our our feedback resistor, which is 7000. And that's going to be over our impedance that we just found. OK, 
Okay. And so this is a whole number. And so there's no phase, but you can just imagine there's a zero degrees there. And whenever you do division, you just do zero degrees and minus that value, right? And then we just do this division outright. So let me do that. Okay, so that's going to be equal to six point. And this is actually in absolute values as well. So that negative goes away. I forgot to mention that. Um, so this is actually going to be 6.79. Um, and then 0 minus negative 14 is going to be positive 14.04. Oops. And so that is our, our gain there. Uh, and so now, finally, we're looking for V out the whole time. So to find V out, we know that the gain is also equal to V out over V in, right? Well, our V in is right here, which is 8 volts. And we just found G, so we can actually solve for V out by just rearranging this equation a little bit and saying V out is equal to VI times G. And so V out is equal to 8 times this, which is uh, 6.79. Okay, so let me do that. So V out is equal to 54.3. Okay, and there we go. That is that problem solved. And what are we looking at time? Ooh. Um, okay, let's do one more quick one. And because I've been recording for a while, I didn't even realize how long, how long it's been. Um, let's do one more quick one. Um, we'll do, actually, I'll see if I can squeeze in two real quick. Uh, I'll try to be quick. So this one's gonna be a low pass filter, right? And this is the same setup, but now we want to find V out here. So how do we do that? Well, these are our values. We're given the we're given the uh, omega, the frequency. We're given, or sorry, not the frequency. We're given omega, and we're given all these values. So now we need to use. Uh, now we need to find the impedance here, which is our Z F. So uh, Z F is equal to. These are in parallel now and not series, so you're not adding them anymore. You're actually putting them in parallel. And that's all to the negative one. And I remember I showed you all how to do that parallel method with this uh, notation. I wouldn't use it for these particular problems uh, just because it gets a little bit tricky with the, the J's. The J's are the complex, you know, so they're a little bit tricky. So let's do ZF is equal to one over 20K because our ZR is right here. Uh, ZR is equal to R, which is just RF, which is right here. So that's 20K. Um, and then we're going to say this is going to be one over one over J omega C, right? Well, we know that one over J is equal to negative J. So what I'm going to do is just bring this negative up and say this is negative 1 over j omega c to the negative 1 still. And omega c is going to be 1 over 20k minus 1 over j omega, which is going to be 2,000. And then C is going to be 300 nanos. Okay, let me write that out. And then this is to the negative one still. Okay, so ZF equals.
zero point zero 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 five minus or plus. Because if we're bringing the J up again, now it's going to be plus. So J zero point zero 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 five nine to the negative one. OK, so now to find Z. ZF. Uh, we need to do all this. We need to do all this calculation to get this right. So let's convert this. Uh, this is in its rectangular form and we can convert it even with the negative one on top. So let's just do this negative or we'll bring out the the negative one. I'm basically just putting on top here. So one one over all this stuff. So this is going to be 0 0.00005 squared plus 0 0.00059 squared 10 negative 1. And then that's going to be over, I have enough room. OK. So that's going to leave us with. Let me type that out real quick. So. One over 0 0.000592. With an angle of 85.23. And now we just have this one angle zero on top and now we can just subtract that so zf equals one divided by that value one six eight nine point negative because zero minus 85 um and that's zf okay so now we can do our gain just like we did with this problem. We can go back to the gain and this is a low pass filter. So let me scroll up low pass. And we can use this one right here. So let's do that. This is gain. And that was the equation we just saw. So. Gain is equal to and we'll just simply plug in our values here. This negative is actually going to go away, so let's just ignore the negative because of the absolute value. So this is going to be one. We just found ZF right here. One, six, eight, nine point one nine. OK, and then divided by RI, RI is right here, 700. OK, and so that gives us. OK, 2.413. And. We just bring down the 85. OK, so that's our gain now, and so now we can do the same thing to find because we know gain is also equal to V out versus VN or over VN. So if we do V out over VN, we know our VN is right here is five volts and then we can just reorder this times our gain right here. So this is going to be V out equals. Five times 2.413. OK. OK, so that's going to be V out equals 12.07 volts. OK. I don't think I'm going to have enough time for another one, unfortunately. Uh, I didn't want to make this too long. I had one more planned out for us to find uh, the bass or the pass band real quick, but um, 
I, I think this one's going over time limit. And uh, so this one's going to be a little bit shorter, but what we're going to do is we're going to have a, um, a second meeting this week for IEEE. So I don't know the date yet, but I'll get with Allison. Um, whenever you guys, uh, if you guys want to know any more, or if you have questions or you need additional help with 1202, um, we're going to have another, uh, like, ask me anything kind of session uh, later this week. Um, and again, I don't know the date yet, but I'll get with Allison. So once we figure that out, uh, I will I will let you guys know, or I'll I'll get Allison to uh, you know message everyone on Discord. Um, I will post these notes on. Uh, I'll post these notes on the on the Discord, and uh, so you guys can see them. Um, sorry we didn't get to the last one, but uh, hopefully this was a little bit helpful. Uh, I know my last one I was kind of like panicking because I was trying to cover so much stuff in a short amount of time. Um, but now uh, this one, I got to go at a little bit of a slower pace. So I got to spend more time working the problems out for you guys. Uh, so for the final, the final exam, I'm going to do one more uh, kind of 1202 review. And um, I would like your guys feedback on which, which method you guys prefer more. If I just record a video and submit it to you guys or, and then we have like an additional kind of, ask me anything questions later or if we just do an in-person session where i'm just kind of freehanding um so we'll, we'll figure it out but uh yeah hopefully this guy hopefully this uh was helpful for you guys um yeah see ya